Hey everyone, I'm Todd Jones and welcome to What's Up where we talk about news, events, and missions. Clear your schedule because Resonate has already made your date night plans for Valentine's Day 2020. Dan Seaborn from Winning at Home is hosting the Marriage Rendezvous at Grant Fine Arts Center. Couples will be treated to music by Ken Reynolds, hors d'oeuvres, and entertainment by Dan. Tickets and more info to come. Our nation is built on individuals who sacrifice their safety and security to ensure ours. And next week, 12 of those individuals who we call heroes are going to experience God in a life-changing way. The Hero's Return takes place next week, and you can honor the men attending by going to the night of prophetic prayer and worship. The event is Friday the 25th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. This will be a time to lift these men up in prayer. There's no child care available, but all are welcome to come up. There's something in the air, and I'm not just talking about the pumpkin spice from the cafe, although I do love me some pumpkin spice. No, I'm talking about freedom. The two-day freedom event Kairos is happening this week on Friday and Saturday. If you have experienced any type of hurt or trauma or just want to deepen your relationship with God, Kairos is for you. Signups are on the website, the app, and at Connection. Pastor Eric and Pastor Paul went down to Lansing last Wednesday to rally for religious freedom. Leaders all over the state met and delivered the Autismus Declaration to the governor. The declaration affirms that God alone is the author of gender, marriage, and human sexuality, which have been clearly defined by his word. If you would like to read and sign the declaration, you can go to autismus.org. If you're new here, we have a special gift for you. Stop by Connections, fill out a Connect card, and you'll get hooked up with this sweet swag bag. What's in it, you ask? Well, that, my friends, is a mystery. And if you want to find out, you'll just have to come to Connections. Thanks for joining us for What's Up. God bless, and have a great day. Ooh, a coffee mug. <laughs> great, yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you're here today. If you are here for the first time, welcome. I'm Paul Rosinski, and you will not be hearing me today. Awesome. I am the lead pastor here, and uh, if somebody drug you here to hear me, you're going to have to come again, and it will be great. We do have today a guest speaker, Bobby Bogard. We told, talked to you a little bit about him, and his wife, Rose, is here with us. Um, I'm excited about him being here. One, uh, Bobby runs uh, whatever you do for Link Organization. Uh, and that's a ministerial association that we belong to and is doing a phenomenal job. I'm telling you what, knocking it out of the park. I just so appreciate what you got going, how you're helping that organization just become really what I think it should be. Ministering not only to the next generation, we do next generation events where we're teaching the next generation how to be leaders, how to reach, you know, what's coming up. I mean, you know, 10 years from now, church is going to look different. We better figure this thing out and help the next generation to do what they need to do. Amen. Ministering to us old guys, amen, uh, with the, the gray hair and all that kind of stuff, and, and just helping pastors in general, starting churches all over the place, uh, and that's what the vision and the goal is. You know, uh, let's saturate the world with the Word of God, we're the restraining force that's stopping Satan from being able to do what he wants to do, and so we just need to make church better. And Bobby, running that organization is just really helping hundreds of pastors, which means helping tens of thousands of people to become better and to reach the world. Well, Bobby's asked me to kind of maybe do a little bit more in the organization, but I said, I'm not gonna do it until you come and see my church. You might not want to replicate who I am. And uh, so I thought he better get a taste of the best church in the whole world. So what better place to do that than here? Bobby, come on up. I've known Bobby for, I don't know, way too many years. Amen. It's been good. All right, Bobby, oh, just my. faithful through thick and thin. And uh, they've never wavered from honoring the word, honoring the Lord, building his kingdom. And they are very, very special people in our lives. Uh, Paul, as we were worshiping today, the Lord brought to my remembrance a time that you and I and Richard Henderson were sitting in a car right outside of Res Life Granville during one of the conferences and God gave me a word for you at that time. I don't know if you remember this, but it was a word that God was calling you to be a father. And I think at that time, in that context, when I gave it, you and I both had something different in our minds. But as we worship today, it's like the, the Lord said, 
that word is on your life and it's currently happening in this place. Amen. When you think about the return and you think about the men that God has given you to pastor and to influence and to set a father's heart in the midst of this culture, God has really called you and I think is going to expand that calling uh, beyond what we presently see. Uh, and maybe it will filter into some of the things that we kind of had in our mind when I gave you that word. But uh, would you take a minute? Because I think we need to honor the word of the Lord over your pastor's life. And I would ask you to stretch your hands this way. So, Father, I, I thank you for Paul. Lord, I thank you for that apostolic anointing on his life, much like Paul of old. God, that you've called him to be a father in your house. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to increase and expand that anointing and build it in the framework by which you purposed it. And Lord, we take our hands off, we take our assumptions off, and we ask God that you perfect that calling which is in his life today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I know why the Lord brought me here, because you're about to have Kairos. And uh, so the Lord sent me here to prepare you to go into Kairos. <laughs> so what I've got to do is I've got to make sure that I've got the right people in the room. So I want to ask you just a couple of questions right off the bat. Number one is, how many of you have ever gotten up on Sunday morning, maybe you're worshiping the Lord in your bathroom, you're so excited about coming and hearing the Word of God, you pile everybody into the car, and all of a sudden, a fight breaks out, and you have a family crisis on your hands. Anybody? I got both hands up. I've had a double portion of that anointing. How many of you have ever maybe been at, at your work and, and maybe somebody uh, said something or you got caught up in the rumor mill, mill your, your name got shuffled through the office or whatever, or maybe you got passed over for a job and, uh, I mean, something just rose up on the inside of you and you were like ready to go find that person and slap them down? Anybody? <laughs> I think I'm in the right room. Any, anybody ever been going through the week, man, you've had a good week, Sunday, you, you, God moved in your life, and Monday morning, you're out, and things are going well, you get to Thursday, things are still going well, I mean, you're rocking along, all of a sudden, Friday night comes, and with it comes temptation, and all of a sudden, you find yourself succumbing to temptation, and you find yourself, instead of overcoming, you find yourself overcome. Anybody ever been there? Come on, honest with me. We've all been there, right? I had a, I had a moment in my life. It was, a, it was a time in my life where my life really just became unraveled. I mean, to a place that, that I never dreamed I would have ever been at that moment in my life. Let me kind of set the context for you. I was in Bible college. I was preparing for the ministry. I was preparing to do what I'm doing today. In Bible college, going after God, fervent in spirit, just loved God with all my heart, was going to save the world. Amen? But my mom and my stepdad ended up coming at the end of my first year, and they were going to be a part of CF&I and, and start school in the fall. Well, during the summer, my stepdad got a job up in North Dallas, and through a series of circumstances, he found himself in one of those moments, and he didn't overcome. He was overcome. And all of a sudden, he's backslidden, and by the end of the summer, we're finding ourselves in front of a judge signing divorce papers. Now, let me set that in context for just a minute, because what you need to understand is that this was my mom's fifth marriage. My dad, on the other hand, had been married three times. As a matter of fact, my dad in my last child support check put paid in full in the memo as if he had paid me off like one of his cows. 
So I was desperate for a father in my life. And this man was that person that I attached my heart to. He became, he became my hero because he became my father. Even to the extent that if you go to the 1974, I hate to <laughs> tell you that, but 1974, if you go to the annual, CFNI annual, 1974, and you find my picture, the name below my picture is not Bobby Bogard. It's Bobby Poole. Because I had assumed this man's name. That's how much he meant to me. We're signing divorce papers. My mom's crying, please don't do this. Please don't do this. We walk out of that place. And all of a sudden, I had one of those moments. My heart flipped. I was mad at God. Isn't it funny? God's not even responsible for that situation. But how many times have you walked out of a situation like that and you get mad at God? I said in my heart, I said, God, if you can't keep this marriage together, then how can you keep me together? And I determined in my heart at that moment that I was going to live the best ungodly life that I could live just to show God. And I did. I began to live a life of sin. Now, the difficult thing about that is that even though that part of my heart was pursuing that in anger against God, the other side of my heart was still passionately in love with him. I still had a, desire, a, a, a burning desire that I had pushed back in my heart to be all that God called me to be. This battle's raging in my heart between being mad at God and being in love with God. Blaming God for the circumstances of my life and yet wanting God to change the circumstances so that I could pursue him with all of my heart. Now I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. I want you to keep that open. We're going to get there in a few minutes. But... Before we get to Romans chapter 8, I want us to go to Romans chapter 7, okay? And just for you scholars, I, I want to give you this revelation. Romans chapter 7 comes before Romans chapter 8. <laughs> so now you have something that you can take home with you. Romans chapter 7 says this. Beginning in verse 21, Message Bible, they're going to put it on the screen. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. You ever been there? You ever felt like that? I, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God. Everybody say, thank God. Yeah. The answer, thank God. Come on, say it like a minute. Thank God. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does something about it. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all of my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. And so here's my question for us today. Is it all right if I'm sitting in this room this morning and everything's not all right? Is it okay if I'm here this morning and I'm not okay? Is it okay if my marriage is in crisis even to the point that maybe I'm contemplating something totally ridiculous? I might even be contemplating leaving my house leaving my wife, 
leaving my kids and moving on. Is it okay if I'm not okay this morning? Is, is, is it okay this morning if maybe I did flip my heart, deliberately went and sinned last night? Is it okay if I made that kind of mistake? Is it okay if I'm here in the house of God this morning? Is it okay if I'm not okay? Is it all right? If I'm not right with God this morning. Now I don't, I don't know how, how it is with you. To determine if you're right or not. If, it, if things are all right. I married the beautiful Rose of Texas. Because behind every good man there's a good woman. Amen. Amen. And besides that we had kids. And the reward for not killing your kids. Is your grandkids. <laughs> so let me introduce you to my grandkids. The first guy here is Judah. Now, this is his first year to play football. We were just down watching him play Texas football. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Judah was born in Australia because my son had gone there to attend Hillsong College, married an Australian girl, and so one of the highlights of Judah's life is to be able to tell the seventh grade girls that he's from Australia. <laughs> now, the second guy, this is Orlando Robert Brave Bogard. Isn't it weird that they named him four names? Orlando Robert Brave Bogard. And you can see, I mean, this guy, look at him. He's the bravest kid I know. I'm telling you, he, he, will, he will charge hell with a water pistol. He's not afraid. He was born in New York City when they were there helping plant Hillsong New York. And so he's got that kind of New York, you know, swag about him. It's like, okay, don't mess with me. And then the last guy here, he was born in Los Angeles. Enough said, he was born in California, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How do you know when things are going awry in your life? Uh, we have the beautiful roads of Texas in our family. And this is how I know when I'm in trouble. This picture right here that she, they're going to flip up of her. <laughs> See, she's had that evil eye from an early age. And, and you know, we laugh at that, but when she gives us the evil eye, it's like, you know, you've been judged, right? And sometimes we're, when we're in that struggle, we're in that battle with God. We're wondering, is it okay if I'm not okay? We almost see God looking at us with the evil eye. You ever felt that? It's like God is looking at me with an evil eye because I've screwed up. It's not all, we, we feel like it's not all right because we're not all right. And yet in this passage in Romans chapter 7, it's almost like the, the author of Romans is trying to help us understand you're going to have these struggles between good and evil in your life, but it's okay. Thank God Jesus Christ has done something about it. Amen. And so I'm not here today. This message is not here today to say that it's okay to sin. Right. God forbid. Amen. Amen. Grace abounds, but not so that sin can abound. Right. Right? right. And so we're not here today to justify sin because sin has consequences. Right. The Bible says when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. The word death means separation. When we, when we die physically, our, our spirit and our soul separate from our body. In that moment when I was in that season of life, my, my intimacy was, with God was separated, right? I mean, you know, God didn't move, but I moved. I made a decision, I'm going to be mad at God. And as I walked into that, the more I walked into it, the more I was separated because sin has consequences. 
Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. So we're not here today to advocate sin, but what we are here today is to say, if we do sin, thank God. Amen? It's okay if I'm in a season where I have a setback because God's already done the things I need to have a comeback. Amen? And so today, I want to drill down on that thought with you for just a minute. Romans chapter 6 says, what shall we say to all of this? Should we continue in sin and practice sin as a habit so that God's gift of grace may increase and overflow? Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live any longer in sin? Right? Right? So we're not going to go there. But what we are going to say is this, there's something that's in the house today that makes it okay if I'm not okay. There's a a person in the room today that it's all right if I'm not all right because he's present among us, amen? Amen. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to give you this little formula that grace is greater than sin And sin is greater than works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Let's look at this for just a minute. I I propose to you that today that it's okay if it's not okay because the grace of God is in the room. The grace of God is in the room. Amen? And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 says this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins... You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else but God. How many of you know you got to love a but God? Amen. Amen. You got to love but God. But God. Now, listen to this but God. Okay. I'm going to read this, but I want you to feel it. Okay. I'm going to read this, but I want you to to filter what it's saying. Don't filter it through what's not all right. Filter it through what he's done because it's not all right. right. Now listen to this. But God is so rich in mercy. Mercy is giving, not giving us what we deserve. And God is rich in mercy. How many of you know rich is wealthy? It's like an abundance, right? It's like more than enough. And God is more than enough. And he's got more than enough mercy to handle any situation. Come on. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much. Is that what that said? That he judged us so much. Does it say that he shames us, condemns us? No, it doesn't say that. It says he's so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. That even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ up from the dead. It's only by the grace of God that you've been saved. You ought to underline that in your Bible. It's only by the grace of God that you've been saved. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth 
of his grace. Listen to that. The incredible wealth of his grace. So he's not only rich in mercy, but he's wealthy in grace and kindness toward us. Matter of fact, let me pause right there. Did you, do you realize it's not the wrath of God that saves us or leads us to repentance? It's the kindness and the tender mercies of God that lead us to repentance. Amen? When he, I just got to drive this home. Somebody needs this. I, I'm going to go there. Listen to me. It's not God's pursuit when we're in that mixed up place, when things aren't all right. God's pursuit toward us is not a pursuit to judge us or to clarify, hey, you, you are messed up. How many of you know, we don't need God to tell us we're messed up. As a matter of fact, I don't need you to tell me I'm messed up. Because I know I'm messed up. I know things aren't right in my heart. I know things are out of place. But thank God. He's rich in mercy. He's wealthy in grace. He loves us so much. And it goes on to say, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Contrary to our personal belief. Uh Uh-oh. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. So when we can do the good things. So that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Here, here's the thing. There's nothing bad enough that we can do to keep us from God pursuing us. At the same time, there's nothing good enough that we can do to get us to God. Right? right? Yeah. There's not enough good that you can do. I mean... Ask yourself this, when do you cross the line of doing enough good that you have earned God's favor? Where is that line? See, the the equation that I gave you is that grace is greater than sin. Because when I come with my sin to God and I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something I cannot earn. Grace is a gift that God gives me in spite of myself. Amen? And grace is not qualified by what I do or who I am. It's qualified by what he has done and, what, and who he is. Amen? And so when I come, grace covers my sins. Grace is the doorway, if you will, to find freedom. Grace, unmerited favor. But here's the thing. Sin is greater than works. And here's what I mean by that. We have this idea that if we do enough good works that we can overcome our sin and then have the grace of God. That's the, that's the formula in reverse, right? But here's what I would propose to you. When I'm doing my works and I'm trying to overcome the sin in my life by the works that I do, I will get to a place that I've done something good and my sin will say, yeah, but you could have done more. Right. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Or I may feel like I've done enough to earn God's favor and then all of a sudden Sin will remind me of what I did 15 years ago. Am I right? And what happened to me 15 years ago keeps me in bondage to the future. Why? Because my works will never overcome the sin in my life. It takes the grace of God to overcome sin. 
And so what I'm saying to you this morning is that it's okay if we're not okay because the grace of God is in the room with us. Come on. As a matter of fact, Paul asked this question, not Pastor Paul, <laughs> the, the Apostle Paul. Well, this is before your time. I'm sorry. I can't give you credit for this. But if you look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, this is a pretty pointed question. He's writing to the Galatian churches. Galatia was not a city. Galatia was a region. So he's writing to a region of churches. Get the context. So if we were in Galatia, if, if Resonate Church... Nuego was in Galatia, right? This would be the letter that he's writing to us, okay? And how many of you know us is believers? He's writing to the churches, the place where Christians assemble. And he gives, he asks this question, listen to this. How foolish can you be? After starting your lives your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? That's a pretty pointed question. And and the reality is that we all struggle with that. Come on. You know, I've been in this thing for, since August 15th, 1972. I was saved at the gospel Man, you got to know, God can find you anywhere. I was at the, I was at the Gospel Mission Church uh-huh. Wednesday night, August 15th, 1972, in Desark, Arkansas. How many of you know where Desark is? Uh-huh. Are you serious? You must be from Hazen. <laughs> Duvall's Bluff. Oh, okay, gotcha. You're from Plains? Oh, Pleasant Plains. Well, you know, and I know, and she knows. I mean, if you're driving through Desert and you look out the left side of the window and you're going east, you're going to miss Desert because it's on the right. (laughs) But God found me there August 15th, 1972, and I was born again. But now it's 1974. I'm in Bible school. And I got a struggle going on, right? And so since 1974, I've got to, I've got to confess to you, I've had a few struggles since then. And I've been a pastor pretty much all my life, 43 years in ministry. And there are seasons that we all struggle with this question. And I'm just here to remind you God's grace is enough. His grace is greater than your sin. Whatever you walked in here with this morning, I'm just telling you, God is greater than that. His grace is greater than that. His grace will cover it. And so I just want to set you at ease this morning. I don't know how you came in here. You may have had the biggest fight with your wife that you've had in 20 years. And you're walking in here and you've got to be spiritual, you know what I'm saying? You got to lift your hands and worship. And you know what's going on in your heart. It's okay because God's grace is here. Isn't that good news? God's grace is here. Now, the second thing is, I, I propose to you that it's okay if we're not okay. It's all right if we're not all right because of the agape love of God. The word agape is it, it, it's the God kind of love, right? So we have eros love, you get the word erotic, so that's like passionate, physical love. You've got phileo, which is brotherly love, the city of Philadelphia. So we have that kind of love. But the agape love of God is different. The agape love of God is love with no strings attached. In other words, you don't have to... God doesn't love you this morning if you do something. All right, God doesn't love you because you are something. God just loves you, period. Amen? The agape love of God is the unconditional love of God 
No strings attached. And I know some of you are getting nervous because I'm right there on the side. But listen to me. God loves you. God loves me. And his love, the Bible says, covers a multitude of sin. The love of God, the perfect love of God, perfect love casts out fear. Right? His love covers. As a matter of fact, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. This is amazing. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. Listen to this phrase. Don't just read it. Hear it, listen to it, feel it, while we were still sinners. Come on. Come on. Yep. Mm-hmm. Boom. <laughs> while we're still sinners, before we ever did anything to get right with God, before many of us ever thought anything about God, right? The seasons when we were maybe even angry at God. We cursed God. Or we, we said we were atheists. We didn't even believe in God. Even at that moment, God commended his love toward us while we were still in sin. Amen. Come on, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta pull that into your heart this morning. I know this is basic Christianity. I didn't come here to wow you this morning. I came here to draw our attention once again to the grace of God that makes it okay if I'm not okay. And the love of God, which makes it all right if I'm not all right, because his love covers a multitude of sin. Amen? And his love is unconditional. So in other words... If I didn't do anything to even initiate the love of God, how can I do anything to keep the love of God? Because he's going to love me whether I do something or I don't do something. He loves me in spite of myself. He loves me in spite of my circumstances. He loves me in spite of my choices. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Mm-hmm. I think of the word broken. Think of the word broken. B-R-O-K-E-N. In the middle of the word broken is the word okay. Mm-hmm. Why? Because God loves me here. Doesn't matter where here is. He loves me here. But he loves me enough not to leave me here. He loves me here because he wants to take me there. Right? He loves me here because even though here is bondage and even though here is confusion and frustration and brokenness and shame, even though here is all those things, he loves me in this moment. He loves us today as we're sitting here and we're not okay. He loves us in this moment because he wants to get us here. And here is freedom, healing, deliverance, salvation. Amen? Amen. That's why God loves us. Because he understands the fallenness of our life. And in the fallenness of our life, he made a plan from the very beginning To bring redemption to us. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now you're at Romans chapter 8. Oh, you should be at Romans chapter (laughs) 8. You led us this. I took a long rabbit trail to get here. (laughs) Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Mm -hmm. Who shall separate us 
from the love of Christ? The answer is no one. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In other words, there's no one and there's no, nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this or not, but back when I was a kid and I had a girlfriend that I liked, I would pick a daisy and I would take the petals and I would say, she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. Now, I always counted them first so that I'd make sure. She loves me. I was thinking about that the other day, and I was thinking about, I wonder how God does his flower. And I thought about, he loves me. He loves me more. He loves me again. And he loves me. And he loves me more. And he loves me again. He never stops loving me. 1974, Christ for the Nations was having some special meetings. I knew the beautiful Rose of Texas was going to be there. I'm so thankful for you ladies because many times you're the reason we have a doorway a guy from Ireland was speaking, and I knew Rose was going to be there, so I thought, ah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go in spite of the way I'm living. I'm going to go. And I went, and I heard a message similar to what I'm preaching to you today. I don't remember the message. I just remember at the end of the message, I was sitting, if this was the CF&I auditorium, I was sitting back on the back left, and God was saying, it's okay. It's all right. And so the, the, the speaker gave an invitation, and I don't remember the circumstances why, but he had us respond to the invitation, and he had us come up on the platform, and there was just a line of people on the platform, and he would go to each individual person, and he would lay hands on them and pray for them. And, and they were falling out on the floor, and I was thinking, oh, gosh, what I got myself into. <laughs> I wish I could speak Irish brogue, but I can't. I just remember, and he, I'm short, but he was short. And he came in front of me, and he went to lay hands on me, but instead he stopped. He pointed his finger at me and he said, young man, God wants you to know that he loves you. And those words were like just a powerful wind that hit me and laid me out for about 30 minutes. And while I'm out on the floor, the grace of God, the grace of God is just Changing the circumstances of my heart. The love of God is healing me and restoring me. And I don't know how you came in here today, but I would just say this. The grace of God is sufficient for our weaknesses. And the love of God covers a multitude of sin. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just one minute. If you came in today and it's not okay in your life, 
I want to give you a moment to just step into what we've talked about. Let this be your moment. Let this be your season of stepping into the grace and love of God. Maybe you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Well, this is a great day to do it. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. I mean, my question is why live another day or another moment under the shame and under the guilt and under the condemnation and under the weight of what you're carrying. And so if you say, Pastor, as you close this service in prayer today, I want you to remember me. I want to I want to give my life afresh and anew to God. Maybe today you're saying, I want to give my life to God. But if that's you, you're in the house today and you just say, hey, things aren't all right, but I'm going to get it all right today. Let me just see your hand real quick. One, two, three, lift those hands. Anybody here this morning? Okay, over here. Anybody else? It's because everybody's been to the return. Amen, good. Anybody else quickly? Let me pray for you. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Father, Father I, come today I come today because of your grace, because of your, grace, because of your, love, because of your love, and I give myself to you afresh and anew. I thank you that you give yourself to me, that your kingdom comes into my life that your kingdom comes into my through the life, death, burial, and resurrection, through the death, burial, and resurrection of, Jesus Christ. of Jesus Christ. Today I declare my freedom in Christ. Today I declare my freedom in Christ. Today I'm healed. Today I'm healed. I'm set free. I'm set free. And I'm free to be all you've called me to be. And I'm free to be all you called me to be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Stay here. Amen. Now, if you gave your life to Christ, it's, it's not a hard thing. It's, it's really just looking to Christ and saying, I recognize I need to be saved. And you want to know more about what that means. I want you to text to 41411, the words got saved. And what will happen is you'll get a link to an email. We're going to ask for your email. And I'm going to send you seven days of teachings that are going to teach you what it's like to have a relationship with a God you can't see, but who loves you dearly. So if you're here or Facebook Live, you go ahead and do that right now and you'll get that link. Bobby, I want to illustrate your sermon if I could. Yeah. I'm God, you're Bobby. So <laughs> if, if you knew my role, you could be God and I could be Bobby, but you're a better Bobby and right now I'm a better God. Okay, okay so that's just the way that works. So in 1974, in a little town in Arkansas somewhere, I don't remember what you said the name of the town was. Desert. Desert, Arkansas. All right. You and God met. Yep. And so why don't you come on over here? And so at that point, it was like, Bobby, you know what? And God embraced Bobby and all the sin and anything that was going on in Bobby's life. We're in a relationship. Yep. And he's calling you son. Mm -hmm. And he says, son, I've got a destiny for you and I've got a plan for you. I want you to walk in this and it's going to be good. Okay. And so you got to let me teach you how to live that life. And that's what discipleship is. Yep. So Bobby starts going on that road and he goes and he ends up in school. Okay. He ends up in Bible school. He's following the will of God. God's doing, you know, and God's plan is being fulfilled in his life, but his heart got broke. And at that point, because of the pain, he made a decision to turn his back. And God was standing here and watching and still with the same plan. But Bobby, take a step away. And Bobby would, could be saying at this point in his life, like many people say, God feels so far from me. I don't think he loves me, but yet God's love is just being expressed. Mm -hmm. Take another step, Bobby. Bobby can start thinking, Man, to come to God, I've got, to, I've got so much to undo. I've got to undo so much to be able to come back to God. And yep. God's just loving on him. And, and God's going, Bobby, I still have that plan for you because the plans of God are without repentance and the thoughts that God has. And God's sending angels and God's extending grace and mercy towards Bobby. Bobby, take another step away. And Bobby's going through all this stuff, right? And at some point, you know, whatever Bobby's thinking, Eventually, he turns around. And that's God's grace. 
And you talk about covering a multitude of sin. Bobby can't run to me. Oh, that's good. Bobby can't do anything. Well, you've got a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> he can't run to me. And when God says his love covers a multitude of sin, I don't, this is what a lot of people think. To get right with God, we've got to go back to here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, we've got to come back to here to be able to then go into my destiny. Yep. But even though all this happened, and Bobby gets right, and there was other things in his life where he got off the path, in 2019, come on. Bobby's probably doing more in the kingdom of God in 2019, affecting more lives in 2019. And that didn't stop it. It couldn't stop it. Now, what would have happened if Bobby in 2019 still would have been like this? Okay, let's say that he screwed his life up, never met Rose, you know, met, met, all these other women, divorced seven times, you know what I mean? Had to outdo his parents, you know what I mean? Right. Combined them both, yep. got divorced eight times, right? And then turns around in 2019. All right. And so God goes, I still created you for this, so we're gonna go from here and we're gonna start taking steps towards the destiny that I've planned for you. So maybe you gotta go back to school, I don't know. Maybe you gotta, do whatever but here we are yeah and Bobby could be going but and God's going but what but what we're just gonna go we're gonna go forward amen we're going towards our destiny I told you he had a father's anointing on him <laughs> <laughs> there's too many of us who just feel like it's too late for me done too much wrong God covers the whole gap now did things change in the destiny and what I'm going to be able to accomplish we only have so much time on this earth Bobby would not be the head of link today if it was this year that he finally turned back to God sin does have a price it has a cost and unfortunately, the cost is a lot of other people. How many people have you gotten the opportunity, the honor to lead to the Lord since, you know, whenever that was in 1974 or when it was when you turned? Yeah. All those people would have been missing out on what God wanted to do through Bobby to them. Your yes is way more important than you think. And you pursuing God and being turned into his face is more important than you'll ever imagine. You do not know the other people on the other side of your obedience. And when people take the grace of God and well, God loves me and I'm okay. Yeah, you might be, but how many people are not gonna be okay because you're not face to face? Think of them. Think of them. not all about you. Amen. Father, thank you for your great mercy. Your great love. Thank you that you just covered the distance that we can't make up. But you can. And just like the laborers that you paid in the fields, <laughs> the one that worked an hour got the same wage as the one who worked all day. You make up for what we missed. We still get you the full wage. But Lord, help us to get other people into the field. Don't allow us to be lazy and 
Allow us to be ashamed and not share you with those we come in contact with. Let your grace flow through us. Just like Jesus doesn't have anything to condemn us with because he absorbs sin, let us be like you and absorb sin and give grace. Let your spirit fill us, Lord. Let your spirit come upon us, Lord. Let your spirit teach us, Lord. May we walk in your grace. There's freedom and joy in the presence of my God for he loves you yes he loves you grace peace mercy love are all that he has to give you So may you walk in the fullness who God created you to be. May all the things that you think are holding you back be washed away from your memory and from your past. May every sin that you committed discard your heart, I command healing and wholeness. May every word spoken against you to contemn you be broken. May all actions against you of abuse or neglect, may those scars now be made whole. May you walk in the fullness of who Father made you to be. In the name of Christ, Father, glorify the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. You guys are the best church in the whole world. Remember, ask your kids what happened in Children's Church today because it was fun. I know that for a fact because my wife is pastoring your kids right now. And I hear about it all week long. Amen. Love you guys. See you. Bye-bye.